But to introduce this, I want to remind you that when we get to Revelation 2 and 3, we come into unique soil in the Bible. This is different stuff. This is probably the most beloved part of Revelation because chapter 2 and 3 are seven letters Jesus wrote. And that's what makes them so special. And that's why there's so much possible to see in this. Uh, Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus wrote letters to his beloved church. It's also special to note that he sent them through the last living apostle. The last, as it were, possible communication he could have in a literary form by revelation through divine inspiration to not only the church present in the world but at that day, but to us in the future. This was the last shot, the last of the 12 apostles, the apostle John. And so these letters were a group message. They were customized for seven churches. But what I present to you is they were not only seven churches present then, but also to us today. And if you would ask any Bible student, uh, in fact, if you went into the Bible classes that, that I attended with my children at Cedarville this past week, and asked how many epistles or letters there are in the New Testament, they would say 21. You know, they'd raise their hands so they could get, you know, the answer to the quiz. They would say 13 were authored by the Apostle Paul, plus Hebrews, which appears to be anonymous. And then there are seven general epistles by Peter, James, John, and Jude. 21 epistles in the Bible, in the New Testament. But what is often overlooked are the seven most important letters, the seven most important epistles, the seven that were authored by Jesus personally. I mean, to think that Jesus sat down and wrote notes. I know that uh, when I get a note from my children, I I mean, I I love seeing how they're progressing and their spelling, and I love to see what's important enough for them to write about. And when I get a note from Bonnie, I mean, I save every one of those. I'm a terrible one for that. I save all those. But can you imagine getting a note from Jesus? I mean, wouldn't you treasure it? Wouldn't you, uh, you know, carry it around close to you? That's what we have in these letters. And for many reasons, these seven letters, which are in chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation, are probably the most important parts of the whole book of Revelation and maybe some of the more important parts of the whole Bible. Remember, the Bible, and I, I've told you this because it's something that's so important to me, but the Bible is, is uh, engineered like nothing else. Uh, we stopped at the Air Force Museum in uh, Dayton, Ohio, uh, as one of our field trips while we were at Cedarville, and, and we, we looked at the engineering of, of our Air Force. And, and some of the, I mean, I'd never seen the Enola Gay, the B-29 that dropped the bombs on Japan and all that, but the fascinating engineering behind our aerospace program is boggling, and it's something very admirable. But did you know more engineered than supersonic warplanes is this book? This is the most engineered object that you and I possess. Think about it. 66 books written by 40 authors over 15 centuries, yet possessing one divinely superintended message. Now, you try and get all of the different departments of your business to all say the same thing, and you would be doing well. You try and get all the members of your family on the same schedule, you're doing quite well. You try and get 40 different authors, most of whom never met each other, writing 66 different parts to one book, and they do it over a 1,500-year period of time. And most of them never have the privilege of reading what anybody else wrote. And you lay them all together, and they fit better than the pieces of the space shuttle. And the engineering flawlessly of the Bible meshes together. That's the Holy Spirit at work. Every word, every letter, every name, every place mentioned, every number written down was placed there under the guiding hand of God through his Holy Spirit. That's why it's so special. And thus, every detail of God's word was planned by God to reveal himself and to reveal his plan to us. And of course, this is most clearly demonstrated in these two chapters. Jesus wrote seven little messages so that not only they, but we would hear. And what's fascinating is there were lots of churches Jesus could have written to. He could have written to Jerusalem, 
first church of all. He could have written to Rome, the biggest church. He could have written to Galatia, the church where Paul poured his heart. He could have written to Corinth, the church that was so zealous for spiritual gifts. He could have written to Antioch, that was first the first place they were called Christians. He could have written to Colossae, where Christ was preeminent. There's so many places he could have written. But Jesus selected these seven. And even the order he writes them is so significant because he had a message for us. And so he wrote to Ephesus, and then he wrote to Smyrna, and then he wrote to Pergamos, and then, of course, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, because these seven represent, and what we're going to look at tonight, a panorama of church history, and especially as we look at paganism and where it came from. Well, if you notice, in verse 1 of chapter 2 of Revelation, it says, to the angel or the messenger of the church of Ephesus, right? First of all, Jesus gives a specific message to each local church. He wrote to specific local churches in geographic places, and it shows Jesus was interested in their local geographic needs, in what the individuals were doing. He calls individuals by name. He knows what they're doing at church. He knows what they're doing at work, and he knows what they're doing at home. In fact, if you just look at that level... It's phenomenal what Christ knew. He knew where they were working. He mentions the the work they were doing. He knows where they were living. He knows just what part of town they're living in. He knows exactly what is going on in the disputes, in the good stuff and the bad stuff in the churches. He names people. You notice what he says. Uh, Here, the message, if you look at verse 7 of chapter 2, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. This is... is, uh, Very interesting because you notice that in verse 7 it says what the Spirit says to the what? Churches. Now he wrote to Ephesus, one church, but he said, I'm writing to you, and he names individuals in these different churches and what's going on, but he says, in a very universal way, this message goes to all the churches, to us, to them, to the churches present then. And the universal churches is an admonition to all churches throughout all of history. And Jesus gives his divine expectations. And and that we've already covered in depth in time past. But Jesus has a message of what he expects from us. And these churches reflect that. But thirdly, Jesus was talking about different kinds of Christians. And and I I love this so much, I don't want to get off that trail. But he talks about the church that that had left their first love. Christians are like that. There's some Christians that... One person said, when I got saved, this was a person never met before, first time they were here, they gave their testimony. When I got saved, I was radically saved, and everyone thought, oh, I'd change, and I never have. They said, I've never lost the overwhelming zeal of what Christ did for me. You know what that is? That's someone who hasn't lost their first love. Did you know most Christians do? They kind of cool down and become normal. They kind of get back to being like everybody else. And they have lost that, that first love, that, that passionate seeking of Christ, which Jesus said he longs for from us. Well, that's the universal message. But Jesus gives one more very interesting concept, and I think this is what we're going to look at. Jesus mentions the unfolding, I believe, of all of church history. And that's where I want you to kind of get this in, in your mind. Because Jesus gives a prophetic panorama. And these seven churches, chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation, appear to possibly be an explanation of what happens in that little space which we studied many months ago between the 69th and the 70th week of Daniel. Remember, Daniel says, 70 weeks are prophesied for thy people. And he talks about 69 weeks of history. And that ends with the crucifixion of Christ. And then he talks about one more week, but he splits in Daniel chapter 9. He splits between those two. He talks about 483 years and then seven more years. And there's a big hole between those. What happens between those two events? I believe that's what's right here. Seven stages of church history. And what we see is the church throughout the ages in seven successive stages And in Revelation 2 and 3, the church from Christ's ascension until he comes and takes his church back to heaven. The church from century 1 to the rapture. 
the seven churches representing seven phases or seven periods of the church history, stretching from the time of the apostles to the coming again of Christ. And what's amazing is when we get to the third period, we find what we're looking for, the birth of the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. 